Good evening. Good evening. My name is Albert Thames. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And on behalf of the school and our faculty, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 22nd annual Scylla Lecture. The Scylla Lecture is funded by a generous endowment from the late Otto Scylla and his wife, Helen. Helen, along with her children, Stephen, Scylla, Alice Ryman, and some of her grandchildren are with us here this evening. Please join me in thanking them for their generous support. Some of you have been with us probably for all 22 of these lectures, but for those of you who are new to the Scylla Lecture, the Scylla Lecture is the signature event sponsored by the Scylla Center for the Study of Media, Ethics, and Law. Since its founding in 1984, the Scylla Center has stayed on the cutting edge of legal and ethical issues affecting the news media. The Scylla Center sponsors a variety of events throughout the year, including an annual Scylla Ethics Forum, which this past year hosted a panel discussion on the new media, excuse me, on the news media's role in covering tragedy, excuse me, tragedies. Uh, coincidentally, this event happened just one week after the shootings at Virginia Tech. The Scylla, the Scylla Center also presented a program on government surveillance and digital privacy and organized a visit by California Supreme Court Judge uh, Rick DeSato as part of a new inaugural Judges in the J Schools initiative of the National Center for Courts and Media. The Scylla Center supports graduate students and law students in their research. These students write and edit a quarterly Scylla bulletin. Copies, by the way, are available in the, in the lobby and on the internet on the Scylla Center website. The work of the Center, Scylla Center is led by Professor Jane Kirtley, Scylla Professor of Media Ethics and Law. As many of you know, Jane is a frequently quoted expert and co commentator on media law and media ethics and speaks all over the world on issues ranging from the proposed federal journalist shield law to the changing face of the Twin Cities news media. This summer, she delivered a series of lectures and workshops on freedom of information in the Dominican Republic and spoke to chief police officers from England, Scotland, and Wales on their annual data protect, excuse me, at their annual data protection conference in Glasgow. Please join me in welcoming Jane Kirtley. Thank you. What is the relationship between violent content in the media and violence in real life? Although the Surgeon General has issued reports on the relationship between violence and television programming, and academic studies have addressed the issue in the context of violence in children, the Federal Communications Commission has never attempted to regulate violence on the airwaves. Until now. In 1972, the FCC rejected a petition that had asked the Commission to force television stations to carry a public service notice that read like this. Warning, viewing of violent television programming by children can be hazardous to their mental health and well-being. In 1975, in a report to Congress, the commission concluded that government intrusion into violent programming would raise significant constitutional issues. It said that judgments about whether violent programming is suitable for children are highly subjective. The then chairman of the FCC, Dick Wiley, suggested that slapstick comedy, the scene in Peter Pan where Captain Hook is eaten by a crocodile, and the poisoning of Snow White by the Wicked Witch all raise subjective questions for which there is no objective standard. The commission believed that violence is completely different from obscenity and indecency, and that industry self-regulation was preferable to the adoption of rigid government standards. Now fast forward to 2007 and we find a very different climate. New media, it is said, present new issues and new challenges. In a report that was issued last April, the FCC concluded that there is a connection between television violence and children's aggressive behavior and urged Congress to take action to regulate and control it. And there are further details about that report in our summer Scylla Bulletin, which as Al said, you can obtain outside. Commissioner Robert McDowell emphasized that any congressional action against television violence should be limited to broadcast and not include cable 
but others believe that a more comprehensive approach is essential. Will the First Amendment be the next casualty of media violence? Well, tonight's Scylla Lecturer is uniquely qualified to help us answer that question. Bob Korn Revere is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of the law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. He has served as counsel in First Amendment litigation involving the Communications Decency Act and the Child Online Protection Act. He's listed on the American Library Association's Roll of Honor for his role as lead counsel in Mainstream Loudoun versus the Board of Trustees of Loudoun County, a library internet filtering case. He successfully argued United States versus Playboy Entertainment Group, representing Playboy, before the US Supreme Court in 2000. In 2003, Bob acted as counsel for a coalition that successfully obtained a posthumous pardon from New York Governor George Pataki for the comedian Lenny Bruce, who had been convicted and imprisoned for committing word crimes, that's an exact quote, word crimes, in 1964 during three stand-up routines at a comedy club in Manhattan. More recently, you may have seen Bob's oral argument before the Third Circuit in CBS versus FCC, the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction case, which was carried on C-SPAN. Is it any wonder that the FCC staff refer to Bob Corn Revere as Mr. Indecency? Well, we refer to Bob Corn Revere as this year's Scylla Lecturer, and I hope you will join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Mr. Indecency, what a proud moment this is. Uh, actually, I should begin by dispelling any rumors. I did fly in from Washington. I did not come to Minneapolis to try and withdraw any guilty pleas. I came through the Minneapolis airport, did not stop in any men's room. I do not tap my feet ever. So let's, let's just make this clear from the outset. Well, this is really quite an honor. I feel like Al Gore here. This is amazing. I'm told this is the first time that the Scylla Lecture will include uh, some kind of PowerPoint uh, presentation, and so uh, we'll see how this goes. It may be the last time uh, that uh, we have a PowerPoint. Seriously, though, I, I do want to um, thank Jane. I want to thank uh, the university and the Scylla family for all that they've done for the support they provide for this lecture series. It is a serious honor to be asked to follow the various luminaries that have delivered the Scylla lectures over the years. It is a key event. Uh, for journalists and for journalism, and it is um, really, uh, uh, as I say, quite an honor to be asked to be part of it. So, that being said, let's start the, uh, the actual issues. As Jane said, this is going to be about media violence and how that raises First Amendment issues and how that plays into the current policy debates in Washington, D.C. As you all know, on April 16, 2007, Sung Wee Cho killed 32 fellow students and teachers at Virginia Tech University and wounded another 17, the worst such mass shooting in American history. Immediately after that terrible event, people began to wonder what could have caused someone to commit such an insane and tragic act. And once the identity of the shooter was known, they didn't have to look very far. As it turned out, um, as more was known about uh, uh, Cho's life, they knew that ever since he was a child growing up in South Korea, he had been troubled, he had been lonely and isolated, rarely spoke to anybody. And when he got to Virginia Tech, uh, a, a number of uh, people observed that he would write his sentiments in plays and essays that were disturbing and violent. Some of his fellow classmates even refused to attend class. It concerned one of his teachers so much that she wanted to tutor him independently. Uh, and not have him come to class. His roommates even reported him to campus security because they were concerned that he'd been stalking several young women. After the tragic events, as investigators started to piece together what had gone wrong, uh, they developed a profile of Cho as what they described as a collector of injustice. And in fact, they found that in writings to, that he left in his dorm room, in a video manifesto that he sent to NBC, he began to identify himself with what they described as twisted references to religion as part of his identity. As a matter of fact, he, he assumed an alter ego. He described as himself as Axe Ishmael, which the investigators described as a name with possible biblical implications. <laughs> 
Now, there's no way to know for sure, <coughs> uh, because uh, <coughs> all we have are the writings and the videos that Cho left. Uh, but the investigators think that he was referring to Ishmael, who was the son of Hagar, the maidservant of Abraham and Sarah. And even though Ishmael was Abraham's oldest son, he lived as an outcast, was cast out of, of Abraham's home uh, when he was a teenager. But this wasn't the only uh, biblical reference that uh, uh, Cho left, nor was it the most direct one. He also, in his role as a collector of injustice, asked in his video manifesto, in his diatribe, asked, do you know what it feels like to be humiliated and to be impaled on a cross? And then added, knowing that his, the events he set in motion would end in his own death, said, I die like Jesus Christ to inspire generations of the weak and defenseless people. Once more information was known, um, the twisted logic that led to the massacre uh, became more and more clear. And as a matter of fact, in a remarkable front page story in the Washington Times, I actually have the original copy here. They reproduced civil commitment papers for Cho that were um, filed in, in December 2005, and basically concluding that he's mentally ill in need of hospitalization, presenting an imminent danger to himself and to others. Now, by now, I'm sure many of you are wondering, why am I spending so much time talking about Sung Wee Cho? Uh, this, after all, isn't really about, this part of it isn't really about media violence or the First Amendment. And the reason I'm doing that is because, inevitably, after a terrible event like this, it doesn't take long before someone begins to say that it must have been caused by violent media, by video games, or by bad movies. And in this case, <clears throat> it came sooner rather than later. <laughs> OK, there's a little bit of John Stewart in here. OK, I admit. Um, Dr. Phil went on uh, the Larry King show the night of the massacre and said that in a matter like this, it really must be attributed to video games. Uh, people who are psychologically fragile will play these games, and then it leads to a culture of violence. And the murderers of tomorrow, he said, uh, are the children of today that are being programmed with this massive violence overdose. Now, Dr. Phil wasn't the only one who took this position. Some tragedy chasers, like attorney Jack Thompson, also appeared on the media claiming that Cho had played certain video games, and this must have played some kind of role in what went on. That's notwithstanding the fact that Cho's roommates were telling interviewers at the same time that they never saw him play a video game. And as a matter of fact, here's a copy of the search warrant that was executed on Cho's dorm room. They found no video games. He simply didn't own any. More significantly, when the review panel, Governor Kane's review panel, finished analyzing what had happened, they also really didn't look at video games as an important factor. The final report discusses other measures that should have been taken on campus, such as security measures, notes that as a preteen, Cho would play games like Sonic the Hedgehog, but not violent games, and a psychologist's report that was appended to the final report says nothing about video games as a possible cause. This, however, and one of the reasons I mention it, is generally the pattern that happens in cases like this. Whenever there's one of these tragic situations, immediately people start looking for a simple answer. This was the case in Littleton. It was the case in Paducah, Kentucky, and Springfield. Many news stories sort of set the pattern and set the narrative for what was going to come. Now, while the actual facts don't establish what you would call a cause and effect relationship between the games that people hypothesized caused these tragedies, there is a cause and effect relationship as part of this story. And that is, when these stories appear, legislators and policymakers begin to act. <coughs> in the wake of Columbine, in the wake of the shootings at Littleton, a number of localities and states started adopting regulations of video games on the assumption that those who play those games are going to be affected by them and commit these massacres. And so as a result, Indianapolis first adopted an ordinance that restricted the playing of arcade games by minors that contained violent themes or sexuality. St. Louis County followed in 2000 with an ordinance that regulated the sale or rental of violent video games. And so it went. Illinois, Washington, California, Michigan, Minnesota, Louisiana, and Oklahoma all followed. Um, there are still a number of states, at least a dozen states, 
that are considering some form of regulation of violent video games. Now, at the outset, Jane told you that the FCC is considering this as well, and that's true. These regulations are not confined to just the state and local area. Uh, it also is something that has been debated for a long time at the federal level, and uh, this year, with the FCC's report issued in April, uh, we're seeing more and more interest in doing so. <coughs> As Jane mentioned, the FCC referenced the social science research. As a point of accuracy, they referenced the 2001 Surgeon General's report that concluded that the research was inconclusive. Uh, it did not look at the research that was submitted as part of the record. Uh, it, it went on to say that the Supreme Court's decision in Pacifica, which is the case that authorized the FCC, or at least approved their authority to regulate indecent speech, could be seen as a parallel that might justify the government regulating violent speech as well. It urged Congress to act and specifically said that Congress could implement what it calls a time channeling solution. Now time channeling is also known in FC circles as the safe harbor and it means that violent programming would be moved to that time of day, that part of the schedule in which children are unlikely to be up. So currently under the indecency rules after 10 p.m broadcasters can show so-called indecent speech, and the parallel would be if Congress were to empower F the FCC to act in this case, that they would move violent programming, however the FCC chose to define that, to a time period after 10 p.m. The other recommendation is one of the uh, current FCC chairman's favorites, a la carte programming, and this would be for cable television or satellite channels, where it would require those providers of those services to offer those channels on a channel-by-channel -channel basis, so-called a la carte pricing. This theme has also shown up in proposed legislation. Senator John Rockefeller in 2005 introduced what he called the Indecent and Gratuitous and Excessively Violent Programming Control Act of 2005. Say that in, in <laughs> 10 times real fast. Um, this would require the FCC to investigate whether or not voluntary measures like ratings and V-chip uh, technical solutions were effective. And if they were not sufficiently effective in the FCC's judgment, then the agency would be empowered to adopt rules regulating the content. It would also extend regulation in that circumstance to subscription media, including cable television and satellite channels. That bill did not pass in 2005, although Senator Rockefeller has pledged to reintroduce the bill this year. And here's one that was not yet introduced, but this language was proposed as part of a, uh, an FCC budget authorization bill. Senator Brownback uh, introduced this language, which would have empowered the FCC to adopt the time channeling solution, and also would have defined excessively violent video programming as a description or depiction of physical force against an animate being that, in context, is patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium. That would be <coughs> the, um, uh, the type of programming that would be moved to late night if the FCC were empowered to adopt this kind of regulation. Now, <coughs> we've been talking, and Jane was talking earlier in the First Amendment issues of matters of, of, uh, important, uh, of importance to journalism, um, First Amendment matters involving news reporting and so on, and so it might not be immediately obvious why these issues involving the regulation of violent programming fit within the confines of the First Amendment. After all, we're not talking about the press per se here, we're talking about a popular entertainment and one that many people might consider to be trivial. We're not talking about petitioning the government or so on. We're talking about playing games and watching slasher movies. So what in the world does the First Amendment have to do with that? I think in addressing that kind of question, it really helps to understand if you shift the frame of the question in a slightly different way, particularly in First Amendment terms. So for example, and one of the reasons I was going through the history at uh, uh, Virginia Tech, is that there was no evidence whatsoever that Cho played video games, but he did leave behind evidence of a connection with religion. So what if we ask the question whether or not the tragic events at Virginia Tech would justify regulating some form of First Amendment activity in the form of the free exercise of religion. For example, if someone could actually establish a connection between Cho's terrible acts and the massacre, would that justify banning religion in America? That may seem a bit extreme. Um, let's try something more narrow. How about people who have psychological problems, uh, like Mr. Cho? Uh, could they be limited in their access to religion?
or as is often the case with these kinds of regulations when adopted by the FCC or elsewhere, they're done in the name of protecting children. What about limiting exposure by children to religious messages? Any of that make sense? Well, let me just be clear. I'm not suggesting that there's any connection between religion and what Cho did. Um, I'm simply saying, as a matter of First Amendment analysis, if you try and make that connection, would it justify these kinds of restrictions under the First Amendment? And I think to most people, it would be instantly clear that nothing that you could argue about drawing a link between one person going tragically wrong and um, those events would justify the kinds of drastic restrictions on the First Amendment. The question that we face is whether or not the same analysis applies to other rights that are protected by the First Amendment. And that includes the rights to entertainment and the rights to speech that might not be the, what was often called the most protected speech, political speech. I think it helps to understand that the protections of the First Amendment are broader than what, you talk, what we're talking about when we talk about political speech or um, uh, the practice of journalism. And I think it was expressed best by Justice Anthony Kennedy in United States versus Playboy Entertainment Group when he wrote that the Constitution exists precisely so that opinions and judgments, including aesthetic and moral judgments about art and literature, can be formed, tested, and expressed. What the Constitution says is that these judgments are for the individual to make and not for the government to decree, even with the mandate or approval of a majority. So the First Amendment, as it has evolved in the United States, is much broader than political speech or simply uh, journalism as practiced by the established press. But that, too, doesn't answer the ultimate question of whether or not you can then justify some kinds of restrictions on games or on violent entertainment, violently themed entertainment, because there are other key questions that have to be asked. First, is the medium of communication one that is protected by the First Amendment? And secondly, is the type of speech that we're talking about, in this case, pictures or images of violence, protected by the First Amendment? Let's start with the uh, technological issue, because I find this one particularly interesting. It's one that I've devoted my entire career to. And that is, how do we treat different technologies under the First Amendment? I find it an ironic question to ask in First Amendment terms for the simple reason that the framers of the Constitution intended to protect new communications technologies. The printing press was the new communications technology of the time of the framers. It was also the only true mass medium, unless you count town criers or, or you know, some other low-tech means of getting the word out. Uh, the framers ex expressly established it as an integral part of the political system. It was part of an essential right of all uh, free people, and one that, um, based on uh, British history, uh, was one that they were going to make sure was fully protected. This, however, has not been the pattern in the United States as courts have tried to interpret what the First Amendment means with respect to other new technologies that have come along. As a matter of fact, what we have experienced over the years is sort of a cycle of first repressive interpretations of the First Amendment as they relate to new technologies, followed by a period of loosening. Um, this was uh, probably most clearly demonstrated when the Supreme Court first looked at the technology of film in the early 20th century. And what's interesting about this is that these decisions that came down at that time predated any of the decisions in which the Supreme Court had actually upheld any First Amendment rights. Even though uh, the First Amendment had existed for over 100 years, uh, the Supreme Court had not applied the First Amendment in any way that was meaningful until 1931. So in 1915, uh, the court was not willing to strike down state restrictions. And in this case, the restrictions involved state censorship boards that looked at films before they could be exhibited in various states. In denying that this medium deserved First Amendment protection, the court in the mutual film case said, the exhibition of moving pictures is a business, pure and simple, originated and conducted for profit, like other spectacles, not to be regarded as part of the press of this country as organs of public opinion. That is the way the court typically treats new technologies when first presented uh, in a First Amendment case. However, over time, as these technologies become more established, as they become more mainstream, the courts are willing to relent and then apply some measure of protection. So 37 years later, after the mutual film case, the court reconsidered this position and decided that, in fact, film was protected under the First Amendment. <clears throat> 
and I think this is the critical phrase from the Joseph Burson versus Wilson case. Each method of communication tends to present its own peculiar problems, but the basic principles of freedom of speech and of the press, like the First Amendment's command, do not vary. Those principles make freedom of expression the rule. Now that seems to state the issue rather concisely, because after all, every new communications technology, or even old communications technologies, are going to present different problems that government may want to address in some way. Print can lead to litter on the street, and so you can have certain kinds of regulations for that. People can be too noisy when they use their voice or some amplifying device, and they might, there might be some uh, regulation that would be appropriately designed to deal with that. Um, film, you may have, have various kinds of regulations for, but that would not change what the First Amendment means for these various technologies. It would simply change the shape of what regulations might be appropriate. However, as other technologies have come along, they have been faced with this same cycle, and as a result, initially not protected. This is certainly the case for broadcasting, which still suffers under some of these uh, greater restrictions than other media. And the case which most directly pointed that out is the first case to deal with it in 1932 by the DC Circuit. It was a case in which the FCC had canceled a broadcast license for a provocative radio preacher who had criticized public officials. And the, uh, the court held that it was not a violation of the First Amendment for the FCC, or at that time, the Federal Radio Commission, the FRC, to deny license renewal because the broadcasts were sensational rather than instructive and uh, also had uh, been intemperate in their attacks on public officials. Now, this, I think, captures just how different a view of the First Amendment is depending on what technology you're talking about. Because these are the very issues that caused the framers to adopt the First Amendment in the first place. Press licensing, there had been the history of that in, in Great Britain, uh, which had caused the framers to make sure that the press was free and not subject to government control through licensing. And secondly, the idea of intemperate attacks on public officials. That's what the press is for. And yet these are the very things that justified in 1932 the non-renewal of a broadcast license. The other thing that's remarkable about this case is that it came about nine months after Near versus Minnesota in 1931, which is the first case in which the Supreme Court declared full press rights for the traditional print media, uh, even though it was on almost identical facts as this. In this case, however, the DC Circuit did not even cite Near versus Minnesota, even though it was not only the best case that was, on, that was on point, it was the only case that was on point, and it had been decided by the highest court in the land less than a year earlier. So the lower court found that it was such an alien body of law because you're dealing with a different technology that it didn't even cite the most relevant case. Now, this brings us to the conundrum that we face today because of this history. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> the, um, this is what we face with the, the doctrine as it's developed today. Every new technology has to win its First Amendment rights, and different technologies are treated differently depending on how you fashion the method of transmission. So if you're a hypothetical federal regulator and you walk into a room and you're confronted with these images, and by the way, this was the oldest, clunkiest clip art I could find to show a television. Um, you know, you see these images, identical images over an identical appliance, and the question that you're confronted with is whether or not you, as a federal regulator, can regulate what you see on the screen. Now, you dearly want to do it, right? Because regulation is what regulators do. But the answer is you don't know whether or not you can regulate those images because you don't know how the picture got into the box. They all conceivably have different means of transmission that um, generated that image. So let's add some content to this. One is a videotape or a DVD. Another is fed by cable television. The third by direct broadcast satellite. Uh, the uh, fourth by broadband internet and the fifth by traditional over-the-air broadcasting. Now that gets you a little closer to home because you can decide at that point whether or not you have jurisdiction and constitutional authority to regulate those various images. Um, and that, by the way, is the, uh, still what we have to do when every new technology comes along. You have to have judicial tests to find out whether or not that technology is going to be protected. So, 
we're left with this. Uh, this sort of gives you a snapshot of how much the First Amendment protects different media. If it's tape or DVD, it is not regulated. It is fully protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and as a result, the picture tube is entirely full. If it is broadcast television licensed by the FCC, you have both affirmative public interest mandates and you have negative content restrictions, like the indecency rules and others. If it's cable television, there is a greater level of First Amendment protection, but it's still a regulated medium by local franchise authorities. There are some content regulations, but not so much as the ones that apply to broadcasting. Same is true with direct broadcast satellite, a little bit more protection. There are no indecency rules, for example. And for the internet, paradoxically, full First Amendment protection. Now, how did that happen? After all, we've had this history where every new technology has to win its First Amendment rights, and we have the newest kid on the block being given full First Amendment protections. The reason for that is that in 1996, Congress adopted the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that included a section called the Communications Decency Act. The central feature of the Communications Decency Act was to attempt to extend broadcast indecency regulations using the identical definition that the FCC uses for broadcast indecency regulations and apply them to online speech. It made perfect sense, after all. I mean, the internet had not been tested as, as a new technology. The rule is each medium is treated as an entirely different thing under the First Amendment. Um, and in addition, you had a definition of indecency that had been tested and had survived Supreme Court review. In 1978, the Supreme Court in FCC versus Pacifica Foundation looked at the FCC's definition of broadcast indecency and said in a five to four decision that that was constitutionally acceptable. So how could this go wrong? Congress adopted the Communications Decency Act and that was that. Well, it did go to court and in successive court decisions, first a three judge district court in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and then the Supreme Court decided that uh, the Communications Decency Act was unconstitutional and a little bit of irony here, the justice who wrote the decision in uh, Reno versus ACLU, Justice Stevens, had been the author of the Pacifica decision involving the FCC's indecency rules. He concluded that this standard was entirely vague and couldn't be enforced under the First Amendment. One of the most important statements in Reno versus ACLU is this. The content of the internet is as diverse as human thought. Our cases provide no basis for qualifying the level of First Amendment scrutiny that should be applied to this medium. This is the first time ever that the courts have looked at a new communications technology and given it complete protection under the First Amendment. As the great First Amendment advocate Bruce Ennis, who successfully argued the case, said when the decision came down, this decision was a constitutional birth certificate for the internet. And it has uh, been a key development in the arguments over applying regulations of various kinds to new technologies since 1997. Which brings us to the question of what to do with video games, because this, too, is a new technology. What do you do with these you know, new aspects of communications uh, under the, under the uh, First Amendment analysis that we've described? Is this a type of speech, uh, or is this a type of technology, a transmission medium, that receives uh, appropriately protection under the First Amendment? Now, the initial games that talked about video games really were very different, and they were different for two reasons. One was the games of the time in the early 1980s, when the courts first began to confront this question, were games like, and you saw in the graphic earlier, Pong, which had no content, <laughs> um, weren't much fun either, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, but as the technology of gaming changed, beginning in the mid-1980s through the present, uh, where they became more artful, where they had narratives, where they told stories, where they asked the player to become a character, uh, then the nature of those games changed. Uh, and the second thing that was different is that the early cases involved efforts to simply regulate zoning of video arcades. Like, did you have to have a license to set up a video arcade? How many games could you put in the, ar uh, in the arcade? So as a result, the cases that resulted from those early cases had no real reason to analyze the First Amendment question. And they concluded at the time that the games were not protected by the First Amendment. This began to change a little bit in the late 1990s, not so much in the decisions themselves, but at least in the way the courts began to confront the question. 
So by the, by the early 1990s, the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, at least, was willing to express some doubt whether or not all video games could be characterized as completely devoid of any First Amendment protection. This then changed in that trend that I showed you earlier in the game regulations that were adopted in the wake of the school shooting in Littleton, Colorado. Because as I say, after the year 2000, um, we began to see the first regulation of the content, specifically the content of the games. And the first of those ordinances was adopted by Indianapolis as a restriction on video arcades. It restricted uh, games that appealed predominantly to a minor's morbid interest in violence or a prurient interest in sex and are patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community for what is suitable for those under 18. The first court to look at this ordinance found that it was, it, well, it didn't make an ultimate decision on the merits. Basically, it denied a preliminary injunction concluding that the plaintiffs in the case were un, unlikely to succeed on the merits of their, of their case. It did say that video games had changed, that they were entitled to some level of First Amendment protect, protection, just not very much. And so it uh, concluded that the plaintiffs were likely to lose and denied a preliminary injunction, which led to an appeal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, where Judge Richard Posner wrote what is probably the um, key opinion in this series of cases so far. First, he concluded that video games are fully protected by the First Amendment. They use art, they tell stories, they involve the players in those stories. And secondly, he decided that strict scrutiny applies. And what this means is that the regulation of content is presumed under the Constitution to be invalid. And it means that the government has the obligation to show a compelling interest in adopting the regulation and is required to use the least restrictive means of achieving its objective. Also importantly, as part of his finding that video games are protected, rejected the government's argument that interactivity of the game makes a difference and instead he wrote this, video games are, like all literature, interactive. And the better it is, the more interactive. When literature is successful, it draws the reader into the story, makes them identify with the characters, invites them to judge them or quarrel with them to experience their joys and sufferings as the reader's own. Judge Posner also went about it out of his way to say that it isn't just First Amendment rights in general that are protected, but that children have First Amendment rights that uh, are protected in a situation like this. That set the stage for then deciding um, whether or not we protect depictions of violence. If the technology is protected, the second important question is whether or not we protect... <laughs> yes. By the way, these pictures do tell a story. Um, and that is, we're talking about uh, all kinds of things that can fall within the overall rubric of violence. The technology is protected. What about the pictures and the imagery that are used? And this sort of gives you a crash course in the kinds of things that people have argued over the years should not be protected as images of violence. In the 1880s and 1890s, uh, the first professional vice crusader, Anthony Comstock, described dime novels with their descriptions of uh, crime and cowboys as being devil traps for the young. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, films depicting gangsters were considered to be um, bad examples and, and should be regulated. In the 1950s, Dr. Frederick Wertham uh, uh, testified before Congress about his book, uh, Seduction of the Innocent, claiming that most juvenile delinquency in America was caused by reading violent comic books. And uh, since the 19, late 1950s through the 60s through the present, we've had arguments over images on television and whether or not they cause problems, including The Three Stooges and Roadrunner. Uh, and of course, well, I really don't need to say anything about that. Um, there are arguments all the time about what constitutes violence and what, whether it should be regulated, and if you are going to regulate it, exactly how you would define it. This keys into a broader question under the First Amendment of what is protected. Obviously, not all speech, simply because you use words, is protected by the First Amendment. For example, if you slip a note to the bank teller and say, give me all your money, it's a word crime, I suppose. You're only using words, but that isn't protected by the First Amendment. If you're a reporter and you're rushing to a, a fire, it doesn't mean you get to speed. You don't get to break laws simply because it has something to do with words. And for, by the same token, there are various categories of speech that are considered 
traditionally not to be protected by the First Amendment. This is a general list that's often recognized. Defamation is not protected speech. Incitement to crime, fighting words, or threats of physical harm and obscenity are not protected by the First Amendment. But because in our the history of our jurisprudence, we have such high regard for the protection of speech, before speech drops off the edge of the First Amendment earth into one of these categories, the government has a high level, high burden of proof before it can do so. The question in these cases is whether or not the category of violence should be elevated and included among one of these unprotected categories of speech. The only one that has been a focus so far is the area of obscenity. Now, I mentioned the uh, standard earlier that was used under the um, Indianapolis video game law that used language much like this. The test here for obscenity is the three-part test that was articulated by the Supreme Court in 1973 in Miller versus California. Basically, it says that if material that's taken as a whole appeals primarily to the prurient interest in sex and it portrays hardcore sexual or excretory conduct in a way that is patently offensive to the average adult, as measured by contemporary community standards, and the material lacks any serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, then it can be prohibited as not being protected under the First Amendment. It has to meet all three parts of that test, and it is the government's burden to prove that it does. Now, there's another category that is similar to that, but it's a little bit different, and this is called variable obscenity, or the harmful to minors test. And under this test, you apply the same three factors as were articulated in Miller, with the variation that you apply those tests to minors. So you look at whether or not something uh, has serious value for minors, which in this test is defined as older teenagers, and you look at whether or not it is patently offensive as to minors. Um, rather than just looking at it for the average adult in the community. And so most of the attempts to try and regulate violence have been based on attempts to shoehorn violence into these categories to say that it is sufficiently like obscenity or it's like harmful to minors material so that we can regulate that too. Well, there's one other difference too I should mention here. If something is considered to be obscene, it is unprotected by the First Amendment and can be banned and those who traffic in it can be, um, can be put in jail. For harmful to minor speech, it's very different, and that is that kind of speech in that category is constitutionally protected as to adults. And so when the government regulates in this area, it can't make people into criminals for, uh, for harmful to minor speech. Um, but what you can do is you can require people to restrict access by minors so long as those restrictions are not so burdensome that adults can't get access to the same speech, uh, the same material. And so an example of that would be if you go to a bookstore or a convenience store and you see the adult magazines, they're behind what are called blinder racks, or they're encased in plastic. This prevents minors from getting access to it, but at the same time, does not impede access by adults so that they can get the material. Um, again, that's just a wrinkle in this sort of unprotected category, sort of a shadow or twilight zone that exists for harmful to minors material. Now, this raises the question of whether or not you could legitimately say that you apply that standard to depictions or descriptions of violence. Historically, the courts have said no. As early as 1948, the Supreme Court considered a case involving a New York statute that prohibited magazines that focused on stories of crime. It talked about um, uh, prohibiting magazines that pro focused on stories of bloodshed and lust. And in that case, the uh, court said that you can't expand this category of sexual materials in the obscenity area or the indecency area and apply that to crime. And went on to say that what is one man's amusement teaches another's doctrine, though we can see of nothing of any possible value uh, to society in these magazines, they are as much entitled to the protection of free speech as the best of literature. This is the most prominent statement by the Supreme Court on this issue, but lower courts have also begun to echo this same sentiment in the cases involving video games, or video in general for that matter. As the Seventh Circuit said in an early case in dictum, that violence on television is protected speech, however insidious. Any other answer leaves the government in control of all institutions of culture, the great censor and director of which thoughts are good for us. This has been applied specifically in the video game cases. Now, as I mentioned, Judge Posner's opinion did find that video games as a medium of communication are fully protected and the government has to meet strict scrutiny. The video game cases have also held so far that violence 
as a type of speech cannot be compared to indecency or obscenity, and that it too is fully protected. And in the uh, case involving the St. Louis Ordinance in the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, uh, Judge Arnold basically drew on the language of Winter versus New York, that 1948 Supreme Court case, and said that the material in these violent video games is as much protected as the best of literature. This has been the consistent ruling by every court that has ever addressed the issue, from cases involving the regulation of the rental of videos, to the regulation of violent video games, to the regulation of magazines. This, is, uh, this quote is from a 1993 case involving the Tennessee harm to minors law, which basically says that every court has struck down these attempts, whether or not the material is called violence, excess violence, or included within the definition of obscenity. And looking forward in a, a profound uh, 1995 law review article, uh, Judge Harry Edwards of the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit looked at both the social science literature and he looked at the legal cases that have been handed down so far and said that he cannot even imagine a definition that would deal with all of the problems of trying to incorporate violence into some sort of unprotected category or a category that includes um, uh, sexual material. Uh, he described this as a jurisprudential quagmire and he did so for a couple of reasons. One is that he couldn't imagine coming up with a definition of violence that would separate out the examples of what you might think of as harmless violence from harmful violence. Um, and he also couldn't think of a definition that would encapsulate those people who advocate harm. You know, the people who say that, based on the social science studies, that they think that people are being influenced by violence. He couldn't think of a definition that would address the types of programming that was described or used in those studies and come up with legislative language that would focus only on that material and nothing else. So, as I say, unanimously, the courts that have looked at this have said that you can't extend the categories of unprotected speech to include violence. As a result, there has been a remarkable degree of agreement among the courts in how to deal with the various ordinances that have been passed. As a matter of fact, from that list that I gave you earlier of the two localities and five states that have adopted regulations of various kinds of video or computer games, in every case, the law has been enjoined, uh, either permanently or preliminarily. And um, in every case, the courts have held that the medium is protected, as well as the type of speech that we're talking about. Now, the other thing that is interesting about this, as I mentioned, this trend is out there. It's you know, very evident that this is what's going on. And nevertheless, a number of jurisdictions are still considering uh, whether to adopt additional regulations. By the way, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, himself no stranger to fictional violence, uh, announced that California was appealing the decision announced uh, this, past, uh, this past August to enjoin the California video game law. He's announced that the state is going to appeal that to the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. I don't know if any of his movies are included in the exhibits, but uh, uh, nonetheless, that ought to be an interesting case. But the other thing is that state legislators often forget to factor in when they're adopting these laws, and for the six that are still being considered, is that under federal civil rights law, if a plaintiff prevails, in striking down uh, an unconstitutional restriction of this type, then you can sue for attorney's fees. You can file a petition and the prevailing party uh, is awarded their attorney's fees. Uh, thus far in the video game cases, we've seen a number of examples of this. This, in these five instances, uh, totals to more than one and a half million dollars. There are a couple of petitions yet um, to be filed. And so this uh, total is going to add up in the future. Now that's for video games. Now keep in mind, I told you earlier that the internet is now fully protected and, uh, and that we see from these decisions at least at the lower court level, video games are protected as a medium and the type of speech is protected. But do you remember that list or that, that graphic of the five televisions which showed whether or not the picture tube was half full or half empty? Broadcasting is still half empty. Uh, that's something that the courts are going to have to confront. It's something that may come up in the cases involving broadcast indecency that are currently making their way through the courts. It's also something that uh, we will confront, assuming the um, 
uh, the Congress acts and empowers the FCC to adopt regulations that deal with violence. So returning to the conclusions of the uh, April 25, uh, 2007 FCC report on televised violence, uh, let's look at some of its principal conclusions. First of all, the Commission concluded that it would be possible to develop a definition of excessively violent programming and that Congress likely has the ability and authority to craft a sustainable definition. This is purely a let Mikey try it uh, kind of approach to policy because uh, for those of us that were involved in the initial FCC uh, notice of inquiry, in 2004, the FCC asked the question, how should we define violence? And it received a number of comments from interested parties uh, addressing that issue. But in 2007, the FCC didn't answer that question itself. And in fact, between, 19, but between 2004 and 2007, a number of cases had come down in the video game area saying that you couldn't come up with a constitutional definition. So it's been sort of shuttled off to Congress. If there's going to be legislation in this area, it will be up to Congress to come up with some kind of definition that avoids the problem that Judge Edwards described as a jurisprudential quagmire. Second, the FCC concluded that the Supreme Court's Pacifica decision could serve as a parallel to perhaps justify extending indecency regulations to the area of violence. And once again, it's hard to know where the FCC's confidence comes from in this area. Um, after all, um, in all of the video game cases, the argument was made that you can extend obscenity law or harm to minors law to cover access by minors to video games. It's not a far leap to apply the same reasoning here. Uh, and yet, um, again, the Pacifica decision has been held up. It will be a matter that has not yet been resolved, but if there are any rules adopted by and applied by the FCC in this area, that's going to be one of the key areas on which courts will focus. And then third, and this is the one that I want to talk about a little bit more, and that is whether, whether Congress could adopt a solution for broadcast regulation that would make any difference to those who would be the focus of such a law and the, the population that Congress and the FCC would be trying to help out. What about a time-channeling solution? That is, if Congress adopted a, a, a law that empowered the FCC to impose rules saying that violent programming on broadcast television should be channeled to a time of day when children are not in the audience. How much would that help? Well, I think this, naturally for me at least, brings to mind Andre Maginot. Uh, for those of you that uh, haven't been taking European history lately, Maginot was the French Minister of Defense from 1928 to 1931. He persuaded his country to build a fixed line of gun emplacements and tank barriers on a 150-mile line between France and Germany. And uh, this was going to make France impregnable to attack from Germany after the First World War. Uh, it didn't really work out so well. <laughs> as a matter of fact, as we see, uh, the red dotted line is the Maginot Line. The red arrows are the German army. <laughs> the tanks and troops simply went around the Maginot Line. It, is, it has become synonymous with a comically ineffective solution to a problem. I suspect that if the FCC or Congress adopted time channeling as a solution to the TV violence problem, what we would find is that we have something of an electronic Maginot Line. Here we have the kids watching TV with the rabbit ears. Uh, and here again is our, our, our friends on broadcast television. Um, and if they adopt a Maginot line, we will have then an FCC-approved solution. So far, so good, right? Well, the difficulty is that the same constitutional standards don't apply in the case of subscri subscription media, like cable or satellite. So the FCC doesn't have the same constitutional latitude to regulate in this area. The Supreme Court in the Playboy case said that a safe harbor when applied to cable is unconstitutional. And so as a result, you have both cable and satellite as a way around this policy solution. You also have online access to video, whether or not you're talking about direct downloads of television shows or you're talking about YouTube, something certainly um, Andre Maginot would appreciate. And if that weren't enough, you also have an increasing array of portable video devices, whether you have your telephone with access to video or an iPod or some game console or other device that provides video, all of which would bypass the protections if you had a safe harbor kind of regulation. And once again, if that were not enough, we live in the age 
of um, DVRs or digital video recorders, services like TiVo. Uh, and as a result, for those who watch television, scheduling is irrelevant. Uh, whether or not something is on after 10 p.m., whether it's on at 3 in the morning really doesn't matter because people who have things recorded on their DVRs can watch them whenever they want. The same is true even if you have VCRs, ancient technology. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, and <laughs> the, uh, you, know, you could always tape things and watch them later um, if you could figure out how to make the clock, clock stop blinking 12 o'clock. <laughs> so what does this, in the end, really mean for the policy? Are we supposed to just give up? I mean, what about the kids? Uh, what are we going to do um, if we consider these images to be disturbing and we need some kind of protection? I think there are two ready answers from a, a policy standpoint. And one is that the technology that has made all of this information available has also made protections available that simply didn't exist when the Supreme Court considered the issue in Pacifica in 1978. That is, with uh, DVRs, digital video recorders, we also have the capability of creating libraries for our kids that we can limit them to in that regard. We have even mandated solutions like the V-chip that allow people to control what kind of programs come into their home or television ratings that didn't exist. We have various commercial services that do the same thing. Even those who manufacture televisions for years have been creating channel locks that allow people to program in which channels they don't want to receive. So there are a number of technological solutions that would have to be considered in any policy debate over whether or not to regulate the content as opposed to regulating or at least allowing people to regulate for themselves what comes into their homes. It's an important question because people often overlook the fact that only one third of American households have children in them. So if you adopt a one-size-fits-all solution, where a federal regulator talks about what programming can be available at what time, you are disenfranchising the two-thirds of homes that don't have children, since these regulations are generally justified in the name of protecting children. The second issue that I, there's really no time to talk about tonight is about the social science. And that is for people who think that we're simply throwing out the interests of kids when we say that it's simply unconstitutional, don't worry about the kids. I think it is important to recognize that the social science that is often cited in support of these kinds of regulations of violence is really often misdescribed and miscited. Uh, it is fine to tell a legislator that there are 2,500 studies and they all agree, but unfortunately that is not the truth. Um, and in fact, when courts have begun to look at the social science in specific cases, particularly in the video game cases, they have picked apart what that science means and whether or not it has a sufficient level of uh, reliability to justify the kinds of regulations that are being adopted. In particular, when the Illinois video game law was struck down, the court took a very detailed look at the social science that was being used to justify it. And not just the published studies. The experts themselves were brought in as expert witnesses and were cross-examined. And the judge had an opportunity to look at exactly what the research means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, and I think any dispassionate look at the uh, research will bring a, a great deal more skepticism than legislators have brought to the table so far. So what about the kids? And there's the title. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, if you get out of the realm of simply policy debates and talking about whether or not social science research justifies this kind of restriction on First Amendment rights, uh, at that point, I think what you really need is a reality check. You need to talk about what is actually happening in society. I mean, after all, for the last at least 20 years, we've been talking about being overrun by all kinds of media images. Since the advent of the World Wide Web, we've been uh, told about how children's lives are going to be completely ruined by this influence. And while, as a parent, I understand fully the need to control what comes into my homes and what influences my kids have, and you know, I take that issue very seriously, I think it's also important to realize that we're not going to hell in a handbasket, and that by any social measure, uh, any of the social indicators you care to look at, things are tending to get better for uh, people in, in that age group. By the way, this is just a continuation of the British invasion. We had the Who before. Now this is a line from a Beatles song. I promise you it's the last one I'll have. Um, in any event, I'm, I'm just showing my age. Right? But, uh, um, but the fact is that by any of the social indicators, things do tend to improve rather than uh, say that because of 
pervasive media images, things are getting worse. Alcohol and drug abuse are down. Teen birth rates have hit a 20-year low in 2002 and are lower today than they were 15 years ago. High school dropout rates are down. Teen suicide rates are down. The same is true of violence, even though we're told that we're seeing pervasive images of violence throughout society. This is true as a general matter, showing declines in the crime rate. In 2004, the Justice Department reported the lowest crime rate since it began conducting the survey in 1973. And even though there has been a modest increase in the rate between 2005 and 2006, the overall trend is still in a downward direction. And over the past 10 years, down 13.3%. The same is true if you look at just the youth demographic. Uh, the um, rate of crimes being committed by juveniles is down 43% between 1995 and 2004. Fewer murders in school today. Now, I did put an asterisk next to this second bullet point, because obviously with the tragedy at Virginia Tech, you're going to see a different uh, outlook overall. But generally, such events are incredibly rare. The trends are down, but you do have terrible situations like that that do occur. And also the number of high school kids who get in fights has gone down by 25% in a decade, a little over a decade. So that's the situation that we face today. What we can predict, however, in the end, is that we're likely to see more efforts to regulate. We will see more efforts at the federal level. Uh, as the trends indicate at the state level, I expect we're going to see more of that um, with the, right now with the six jurisdictions that are looking at regulation of video games. I expect we will see uh, more of that occurring. Um, it will become part of the national debate uh, again at some point. And yet the legal trends, at least so far, are solid. This is a quote from uh, Judge James, Ro James Rosenbaum from the District Court here in Minnesota, and it is taken from the case in which the Minnesota video game law was struck down. And I think it really does put its finger on this uh, phenomenon of seeing more and more jurisdictions adopt laws in the face of what they know uh, must be unconstitutional. Judge Rosenbaum said the court will not speculate as to the motives of those who launched Minnesota's nearly doomed effort to protect our children, who, after all, could be against protecting children. But the legislators drafting this law cannot have been blind to its constitutional flaws. I really could not have put that better myself. And I note that uh, Judge Rosenbaum is a 1969 graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. You must be very proud. So with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. So now, for a few minutes, we'd like you to join the conversation. Bob will be happy to try to answer your questions. If you will raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. Um, in order that we may take as many questions as possible, we ask that you try to keep your question focused and to the point. So hands up. And yeah. First, let me ask you a question. PowerPoint yes or PowerPoint no? Yes. Do student newspapers, college newspapers, and high school newspapers enjoy any um, less protection in First Amendment from public newspapers? Yes, but not in, to the same degree for all. I mean, uh, the courts have recognized that there is less protection at the high school level, particularly where you have a school newspaper that is sponsored as part of the curriculum. The schools have a great deal of control, less so in, when you're talking about a newspaper that's part of a higher education curriculum, although there was a case in the Seventh Circuit from a couple of years ago that tested that proposition. The uh, Supreme Court did not accept that case, but. Uh, uh, for now, you have a greater level of protection at the university level. I'm aware that the FCC's present chair has pushed this idea of looking at a way of regulating violence on television even before he became chair. The question I have for you is, can you help to enlighten us as to why he is pushing as hard as he is when he realizes perfectly well all of the obstacles that are in front of him? Is this pressure coming from the central administration. Uh, where is it coming from? Do I know what Kevin Martin is thinking? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. 
what I can say is this, and this is one of the reasons why I ended with this quote from Judge Rosenbaum. I think it really captures what is going on legally and politically at the same time. Legally, the trends are absolutely clear. The legal obstacles, I think, to adopting any kind of regulation like this, either at the local level or if the FCC does it for national media, are insurmountable. I think the definitional problems are, are very daunting. I, I think coming up with the level of proof is really difficult. And the fact that there are less restrictive measures everywhere uh, are, you know, is, is another powerful reason why I don't think any kind of a law like that would survive. But whether or not a law would survive doesn't always explain why policymakers push that law. When I first came to the FCC as a staff member, I had the outgoing person in my position as a legal advisor to a commissioner say, you know, we know that at some point we're going to lose in court over the indecency rules, but you have to understand there's no political downside to championing a strong indecency policy. Because if we do it, people will love us, and if we get struck down by the courts, it's not our fault. And so I think that kind of political sentiment often captures what's going on with state legislators or sometimes with the FCC, and that may be what's operating here. Is violence an addiction, and have we not recognized that it's an addiction? I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question because I'm not sure if you're asking whether or not there is a clear recognition that that is a fact or whether or not that argument has been made. Well, I didn't centralize the, the, the words into a reflection on rape and um, in, incest and other forms of sexual violence. But uh, sexual violence and, and television uh, might have, uh, there, there is a lot being done in studying the correlation between those images and life experience in our lives. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure how to answer the question about addiction. I mean, I think there are a lot of things that we talk about being addictions today that are preferences, but the word addiction is a bit strong. Um, I don't think they're really comparable. In terms of the social science research, there is a lot of social science research out there and has been done since the early 1960s. A lot of it concludes that there may be some kinds of violent tendencies. The Surgeon General in 2001 looked at the body of research and said it was largely inconclusive, that studies went all kinds of different ways, um, but that it merited further serious study. Um, there are basically three types of uh, research that are conducted. There are laboratory experiments, there are field experiments, and there are longitudinal experiments. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses. The um, laboratory experiments largely are artificial. You try and create a condition where you're going to expose someone to some kind of violent stimulus and see how they react to it. But those studies, which by the way, come out with varying degrees of positive results, whether or not that represents um, aggressive thoughts or aggressive activity, um, are not very generalizable. For example, you'll ask, you'll show someone an image and then you'll see how quickly one test subject recognizes a violent word as opposed to another test subject. Or you'll ask, in the case of the video game studies, whether or not one test subject who played a violent video game for maybe as short as 10 minutes will be willing to apply a sound blast to disturb his neighbor for a longer period than someone else who's shown some, uh, played another video game. Uh, and, and the problem is those indices of whether or not represent aggression don't really tell you much about how people are going to act in the real world. The field studies, uh, because they're in a more naturalistic setting, tend to be more reliable, but the problem is most of them show negative results. Uh, they don't show that there have been, uh, because you're observing people in a naturalistic setting, they don't show that there is much of a tendency toward violence. And the longitudinal studies, which by and large are the ones that legislators have looked to in the TV violence area, are ones that have a lot of hype behind them, but I think they've been badly misrepresented. One study, it's not even a study, it was a comparison published in 19... 89 by a, a man named Brandon, Brandon Centerwell uh, said that half the murders in the United States were, were caused by television. And he used that language, that it was a cause and effect relationship. And he did so, he reached this conclusion by comparing the murder rates in South Africa, Canada, and the United States after television was introduced in each of those countries. 
Now, he reached that conclusion comparing South Africa because it had, been, had television introduced most recently. It had been banned before 1975. But in comparing the countries, didn't really take into account that the political conditions in South Africa in the mid-'70s were somewhat different. Uh, than, than they are here. I mean, as I say, there, there is a lot of research out there in terms of using it to justify policy, not very good. And that's exactly, as I say, when you, when you go to a legislature and say, I have a thousand studies and they all demonstrate that there is a problem here, that's the kind of thing that you hear at congressional hearings. In a court of law, as has happened in the video game cases, you have a specific deconstruction of those studies and uh, you have judges that are really not very impressed with the results that they're seeing. A good example of that, again, I mentioned it earlier, is the Northern District of Illinois in striking down the Illinois video game case. The judge specifically, you know, not just read the studies, but looked at the, or uh, watched the cross-examinations of the researchers. What he found was those that claimed positive results um, would say that the sound blast that was administered to other test subjects only lasted milliseconds longer for those subjects that, uh, uh, it was claimed were, had more aggressive tendencies as a result of the violent video game they had played for 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, again, social science research, I don't want to discount it as a matter of social science research, as a matter of policy, and as a matter of restricting First Amendment rights on the basis of those kinds of findings. In that situation, I'm very skeptical. Thank you. Yeah. I had a question about the... Hi. <laughs> oh, okay. About the 1997 decision to extend the First Amendment protection to the internet in such yes. a complete way. Um, do you think that part of the motivation of the justices wasn't just the preserving the diversity of human thought, but because they thought that maybe like, like it, human thought being diverse, it's also really hard to control and that the internet um, is something that if they did try to regulate it, they would be undermined by, its, by their inability to control it, actually? Yeah, that's a very good question. As a matter of fact, that was an undercurrent of the decision. One of the things that the court recognized, and this was based on a very detailed technical showing at the trial court level by the uh, lawyers for the American Library Association and the, and the ACLU. They presented a very complete picture of the internet as it, as it existed at that time. And so I think it gave the court a real understanding and a real appreciation for the kind of speech that they would regulate. And as a result, in addition to noting that it was, a, as they put it, uh, one of the lower court judges put it, a never-ending worldwide conversation, uh, they also noted that any kind of regulation that you try and impose in the United States is really a local ordinance. You know, we're talking about a global medium. You might be able to go after someone that hasn't, has put indecent speech on the internet in the United States, but you still have all of the websites around the world that you're not going to be able to enforce the law against. This is an undercurrent that has uh, cropped up in a number of the other decisions involving internet speech since 1997. And it's an important thing to keep in mind because it's co a completely different medium compared to the ones that were litigated in earlier cases. Uh, what role do you think that media play in perpetuating the push re regulation? I'm sorry, can you what repeat the question? What role do you think the media plays in the push for um, regulation in public opinion? As I mentioned earlier, with all the news stories that came out after the, uh, uh, the Columbine school shooting in Littleton, Colorado, there is a narrative that has developed in the reporting on various events. Uh, I, I focus here on the tragedies that have happened because those are the biggest news stories. But the first thing that a lot of people will look for is some indication that the media made the killers do it. As a result, you had stories about the fact that the shooters in Littleton, Colorado listened to Marilyn Manson, and so as a result, Marilyn Manson made them do it, or the fact that they liked to play Doom, and so as a result, Doom made them do it. You had hundreds of stories that went after that angle, and then you also have pop psychologists like Dr. Phil who will say these things, and it's largely unchallenged. Uh, I, I think that is more persuasive to legislators and to policymakers who are going to be making these decisions initially about whether or not to regulate in this area. And politically, it's a very attractive thing to do. After all, it's for the kids. And so how can you not want to protect them? And you don't need to look too deeply on whether or not that really is the cause of the problem or whether or not the solution that you've proposed is actually going to help them. 
And so as a result, I think the media, by uncritically looking at some of these issues, uh, has perpetuated this cycle where policymakers will adopt regulations, notwithstanding the fact that they know full well, because their staffs will tell them so, that those regulations are going to be struck down in court once they're adopted. To them, it's not their problem. They pass the law, someone else is going to deal with it later. I think, to a certain degree, there has been some improvement in that. I think there, you'll find more critical reporting about that now than you did 10 years ago. Uh, and more and more books are now coming out that take a critical view. But uh, it has played a role in the passage of those kinds of laws and, and regulations. Otto Silla would have loved this afternoon's conversation. And what he would love even more is for you to stay and continue to engage and to discuss these ideas. And we invite you to join us in the atrium where we have refreshments available. And hope that you will join me in thanking our lecturer, Bob Turner. <laughs>